Well, welcome aboard this edition of Wild Goose Adventures. There's two things that I really appreciate, and one of them is finding interesting and exotic locations, and the other one is meeting interesting people. And today I'd like to introduce you to someone who I found very interesting as we go and learn to fly the drone. Let's sheet on and head on over. Okay, well here I am with Stuart. We're going to fly a drone. Hi Stuart. Hi David. How are you doing? Good to be with you. Good, good to be here too. How fun is this flying the drone business? Oh, I'm looking very forward to it. <laughs> Even better that it's not mine if it, if it crashes. <laughs> no, I hope we won't crash it we, we won't crash it, trust me. Right. No, that's okay. I'm a little bit nervous about it to be honest. I, I enjoy uh, photography tremendously. And uh, a few years ago, I, I tried my hand at flying model airplanes. So oh, fantastic. This, this is just a wonderful combination, and I've always wanted to get into it, and uh, just thrilled that I've got the opportunity today. <laughs> and so, Stuart, can I just ask you, you're here in Bundaberg, what brought what you here to Bundaberg? <clears throat> We're originally from South Africa, and I think you can probably tell from the accent, but um, we came across three years ago, uh, when I received uh, the opportunity to work in the Uniting Church in Bundaberg here. I'm a minister, spent all my life in the Methodist Church in South Africa and um, uh, had this opportunity to come across. Yeah, and whereabouts in South Africa are you from? We, uh, we came from Durban, so we lived in several places in South Africa. I grew up in Johannesburg and uh, that's where I met my wife Debbie, we got married there lived in Pretoria for a while, but the bulk of my ministry was spent in uh, in Durban on the East Coast, which is actually very similar in weather patterns and grow, they grow sugar cane as well, uh, to Bundy. There's things that we've um, uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed and embraced about Australian life and yeah. very grateful to Australia for the welcome that we've received and the, the friendliness and the warmth of Australian people. It's been tremendous. And I, you know, I've got to say that I met Stuart because I was a wedding photographer and uh, he was at, I did some weddings at his church and then that moved on, our paths crossed a few extra times and I really wanted to have Stuart here and for me it's an excuse the drone to uh, introduce <laughs> you, you to Stuart because he's a fantastic bloke. So without Thank any further ado, let's cool. go. So let me just talk a little bit about this. The drone itself, this yeah. is a, a Mavic Air 2. Okay. And so, as you can see, it's got a camera on it. Yeah. Now, it's controlled by this controller here. Right. Now, the controller has um, has two little wings. Right. And so, the one here on the left controls up. Okay. And down, and then for it to spin either left or right. All right. And this other controller on the right will control it going forward, backwards, or sideways. Okay. And that's it. Right. <laughs> so it's not really much to it. But what we're going to do... Does it keep itself level? If you, if, if, you... if you have trouble, just let go and it will just hover. Oh, okay. It, unlike your model aeroplane days, <laughs> that crashed if you didn't do <laughs> that's, it right. <laughs> that's, there were a few of those. <laughs> this, if you let go, it all runs by GPS. And even in the breeze that's here today, it will just hover and stay still. Oh, okay. Jeez, that's incredible. So what I've done is I've set up a little, a little square here uh, right. as part of any CASA training. When I did my CASA, got my CASA license, we spent a lot of time just flying squares and just learning okay. to control it. And so before we go and have a bit of a buzz around the park, what I'd like to do is just let you take control and get the feel of the, uh, the controls okay. in a controlled environment. It's, I've got to say that we're at a school here that's closed, that's closed down, there's no one around, so it's perfectly safe and a great spot for us to fly. So we're ready to go. Okay. We've just checked our spaces, so we've got a little bit of breeze, the breeze is, any breeze is going to blow it that way. Right. We're standing out of our way. We're just going to fly it just above head height just okay. so that we can't hit us in the head. Right. Give it a go and uh, just hold it down a bit. There we go. 
And that's it. So that's about it, huh? Yep. And then just go forward. And the other thing which I didn't show you is that just leave it just there. If you hold, see on your left button, yeah. your right hand, if you press that, that's the video. So if you press that, okay. And now we should see, now it's starting to video. Oh, it's starting to record. And so what we want to do is we want to just go to the mark and then spin it round. So while you're flying, Stuart, what, yeah. what's your uh, what, what, what's your feeling of South Africa? What are you growing up in South Africa? Um, we, I had a, a wonderful childhood growing up. My father is a Methodist minister, and um, so I grew up in the church, and uh, that was um, it was wonderful, but um, also quite a sheltered upbringing. Um, South Africa in those days, I grew up in the days of apartheid and um, we, were, we were part of a family, the Methodist Church was not a, a friend of apartheid, they had uh, right from early days said that they stand against it, so we grew up in a house that um, wasn't uh, pro-apartheid, if you could put it that way, but you, you would still so just keep flying. What I want you to do now is go back. We'll continue that. Okay. <laughs> just go to the next. So this time, what I want you to do is go to the to the um, first cone that we went to. Okay. And then instead of turning left and going, what I want you to do is fly sideways to the next one. Oh, okay. It was an interesting time to be growing up, David, because um, it was around the time that all the all the changes were happening. Yeah. So um, I was finishing school when when Nelson Mandela was being released. Yeah, now on this one, sorry, we're going to fly backwards to the. Okay. <clears throat> As Mandela was being released, we watched all of that, and it was a very exciting time to be part of South Africa. Um, there was a whole uh, new South Africa that was touted, um, Rainbow Nation, and 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 people got behind this the sort of wave of optimism. We won the 95 Rugby Union World Cup, which was a, a, a phenomenal moment of nation building as a country. Yes. But um, it wasn't too long after that then things started to go, uh, go a bit wrong. Corruption crept in and uh, racial tensions flared, um, that type of thing. And uh, slowly, probably, after Mandela's five years as president, um, things really started to um, to go down, and we we kind of felt that we needed to be part of the solution and work within the system. By this stage, I had entered into ministry, changed from electrical engineering, which is a story in itself, but um, entered into ministry and tried to work the work changes from from that angle. Yeah. So in the you know from electrical engineering, I presume it was mostly white when you started electrical engineering. Yeah, it and was. Then, um, but but from my final year in year twelve, uh, people of colour had started entering into the schools and and into the systems um, of education, which previously had been closed off to them. Yeah. So you know, apartheid was a. A horribly evil system and 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 terrible from that aspect but but as a social engineering thing it was very cleverly done so everything was controlled your newspapers your TV your and it was only when uh, people of color started to come into my school that I actually asked the question well where were they going to school before this <laughs> you know there was that the yeah. engineering of the system yeah. was so clever yeah um, that that's that's how it had worked. So look, well, you're doing a great job here. We're chatting. So why don't you take it up to 20 meters? Just go up. Okay. And wow. then you can see on the screen. Oh, sorry, I went too far. No, that's okay. And now just give it a give it a slow spin. 
Okay. And then you can see on the... Where do I look at the... Just have a look at the... Wow, that's beautiful. So suddenly we can see so much more, and this is to me the joy of flying a drone. Yeah. Is that now you get a totally different perspective. That's incredible. I can see my house from here. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go, go another, go to 40 meters. Wow, okay. What's the range of it then? So, well, we're legally allowed to go to 120 meters high. After that, we start going into commercial airspace. Okay. And so we don't fly more than that, but... Wow. It's but 40. what's the range that this thing can fly? Oh, seven kilometers. It'll get, oh. ice, it'll get ice before it... Oh, grief. Uh, okay. Wow. But we're not allowed to do that because yeah. we that's how you get in trouble with aeroplanes. Right. Because aeroplanes aren't allowed to fly under 120 metres unless they're coming into land, which is why you're not allowed to fly around, around an airport. Around an airport. Okay. But you can see the perspective. That is fantastic. I didn't realise the school was so big. I can't see how smooth the picture is. Yeah, you can see us. Now if you see your left finger here, yeah. see the little lever that's on that finger there? Just yeah. roll that down a bit and that points the camera down towards us with it. Oh yeah. And we can wave and say, hello! <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's it. And then if you fly backwards and up, okay. That's amazing, David. <laughs> so much fun. It is pretty. It's it is cool, isn't it? It is great. Yeah, absolutely. So you you were just talking about engineering, and you were there engineering, and then things changed, and that made you start thinking, well, where was everyone else going to school, and what else was happening? Yeah. So you you sort of um, begin to think a little bit broader than than just yourself, and also I think the work experience helped with that. So, I mean, I. I always knew that God wanted me to be in ministry, but I kind of hoped that I could avoid it. I had <laughs> felt that um, growing up in a minister's home, I thought, oh, I've, I've uh, done enough of this. I've, um, I want to go make some money. You know, there's not a lot of money in ministry. So I thought, well, um, I'm going to go into engineering. But in my heart of hearts, I knew that God wanted me there. <laughs> so I went into engineering and, um, and uh, did okay. But, uh, but in my work experience, I had a really good work experience and then a, a, sorry, it was the other way around, I had a really shocking work experience and then a really good one. And uh, it was in that work experience as well that you sort of, uh, your perceptions got blown a little bit wider and you, you sort of learnt a few things in the world and, and came out from under the shelter of being in a church yeah. environment. Yeah. yeah. And... And that did that, that shock you? Did it sort of just make you grow up and make you sort of see a different perspective? No, it shocked me. It it shocked me incredibly. Um, I got into this this uh, factory environment with um, you know people who couldn't even spell the word church. Never mind uh, uh, have any kind of inkling of it. And um, and it, it it blew my perspective wide open. And uh, certainly in terms of my own faith was was a moment of saying, okay, well, well, what do you, how do you want to live? Do you want to live like the way you've grown up or do you want to live in this way? Yeah. And that was part of my, my move into, into ministry. Yeah. Um, because I'm yeah. guessing that in that time, the people that are working that don't know how to spell church, let alone know what it is, if, if it's anything like Australia, it's a pretty rough environment and there's, people who maybe come from a totally different place hmm. where you're coming from. Yeah, and, and, and that was actually part of the part of the difficulties for me was that they noticed that I didn't uh, laugh at the kind of jokes that they told or speak about women the way they spoke about women. I never once said to anyone, um, oh you know I'm a Christian or anything like that. But just by the by the behaviour I, I stood out of it. 
and so they would do things to me to try and uh, I don't know um, get me to swear or whatever and, and at one stage I remember they held me underwater in this testing tank in a crane strapped me in a crane it was kept at 10 degrees and they would hold me under for 10 seconds and then bring me up and then 20 seconds and then 30 seconds and you know it was that kind of thing just to try and see if they could really just make my life a bit of a misery and I remember after that saying oh, definitely I'm going to go into the ministry I've had enough of this and it was just after that that a friend in a in a medical company said I'm sick and tired of what's going on let me get you I've got a job for you at our company and I began working in this beautiful environment where I was traveling I was working with a good mate it was it was phen phenomenal doing engineering that I loved hospital environment ICUs theater systems and uh, it was at that point that I I kind of felt God was saying to me you do, you were willing to go into ministry when things were going really badly <laughs> are you willing to do it when they're still going well wow and uh, and for me that was a but I worked at that company every year. It was a, a journey for me to saying, well, am I willing to? Yeah. And got to the point of saying, yes, I actually do know this is what God wants me to do yeah. for my life. Yeah. I need to be, I think for me, as much as I enjoyed engineering, uh, by going into ministry, I was in an avenue where, where I felt it could really impact people's lives directly yeah. in terms of just the, the kind of things and I guess too it gives you a new sensitivity a new appreciation of what other people go through absolutely absolutely and I cannot tell you how many times that factory experience and the medical engineering have I believe David enriched my ministry by by giving you a bit of you know you have some credibility in yeah. terms of I haven't just walked out of school and into the church um, I've, I've done other work. I've been involved in, in, in industry and, and know a little bit about it. Yeah. Well, we might leave this conversation with Stuart until the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Stuart. He certainly is a man of conviction and a man of honour. Next episode, we are going to step up our drones. We're going to step up into Junior, my Inspire 2, and he can learn to fly a commercial drone and see the difference that that will make. We're also going to hear about how he met his wife and about how he ended up in Bundaberg. And then, of course, the thing that inspires me most, and that is the incredible work that he's been doing in the community of Bundaberg and just trying to better the place and better the people in it. That's it for this episode of Wild Goose Adventures. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, smooth sailing.